Welcome back everyone. Uh, in this lecture, uh, let us talk about uh, partition of a set uh, in a more abstract uh, way and then uh, we try to understand them uh, using our cosets. Okay, uh, let us start with a set capital X. Let us assume it to be a non-empty set. So, this is a non-empty set. So, a partition of this uh, set capital X, it is a collection of subsets of capital X. Let us call them A alpha. Alpha runs over some indexing set capital lambda. Okay. So, this is called a partition a partition of capital X if the following happens. So, first they are all subsets A alphas are all subsets of X and then they they cover entire X that means the union of A alpha is exactly X and they are actually either equal or dijon. So, they form a partition. So, that means A alpha either equal to A beta or A alpha intersection A beta must be empty for all alpha not equal to beta in capital lambda. So, such a collection we call it a partition of capital X. So, in general set theory uh, there is a way actually to get partition actually uh, having a partition is equivalent to uh, such a way. So, let us see what is that. Okay. So, that is actually motivates uh, uh, us to define what is called equivalence relation. So, partition can be obtained from equivalence relation. Let us see how one can apply obtain. So, first of all let us define what is an equivalence relation. So, again we fix this capital X and then we want to define an equivalence relation on capital X. So, generally we rely uh, we write relation as tilde. So, let us fix that uh, notation. So, a relation tilde so a relation. So, a relation by definition it is a subset of X cross X. So, a relation so, by definition it is a subset of x cross x. So, is said to be an equivalence relation if it satisfies three properties. One is reflexive, second is symmetric and third one is transitive. So, let us see what it is. So, the first one is called reflexive. So, that means x should be related to x for all x in capital X. And the second condition it is called symmetric. So, if x is related to y then that should imply y is related to x. So, that means x related to y if and only if y is related to x for all x comma y in x. And the third relation is called transitive which is very important relation. So, whenever x is related to y and y is related to z, then that should imply x is related to z, and this should be true for all x, y, z in capital X. So, basically an equivalence relation is defining a relation on capital X and then that satisfies these three properties and once we have this equivalence relation then immediately one can define what is called equivalence class related to each element of capital X. So, for X in X, so what is equivalence class? Usually, we denote it by bracket X. There are many notations that are used in the literature. Let us stick with this bracket X. So, this bracket X that is defined using this uh, tilde is those Y in capital X such that Y is related to X. So, this is called equivalence class that is define using this given element x. Basically, you have a relation 
on capital X and then you fix an element and then collect all the elements that are related to X. So, that is your equivalence class X and it is not that hard to prove. I will state it as a lemma and leave it as exercise. So, this is a very easy verification and one can prove that if you take any two equivalence classes call it class X and class Y okay, for any X comma Y in capital X. So, either the equivalence class X and equivalence class Y they are equal or otherwise they are disjoint. The equivalence class intersection equivalence class Y they must be disjoint. Okay. So, in particularly what we can do we can actually take all possible equivalence classes form a set okay, X in capital X and then if you consider the distinct elements in this set basically this is a power this sits inside the power set of X okay, because we collected equivalence classes, equivalence classes are nothing but uh, subsets of capital X and in this collection this uh, e set of all equivalence classes they lie inside this uh, power set of X and then mo mostly they are denoted by this X modulo tilde. So, this is called the set of all equivalence classes, set of all equivalence classes okay, of course, related to that uh, capital X and the relation tilde. So, now what one can prove actually one can actually uh, choose a parametrizing set for this uh, X modulo tilde. So, what is it? We can call it capital lambda as the indexing set or the parametrizing set for this. So, it is any set that has natural bijective correspondence with this X modulo tilde. An indexing set of this equivalence classes is a set capital lambda that is actually has bijective correspondence with this X modulo tilde. So, then using this lemma it is easy to see. So, here is a proportion that this X is nothing but union of this equivalence classes bracket X where this equivalence classes runs over X modulo tilde. And in general in most of the time in practice what we do we choose this capital lambda as a part of capital X only. Okay. So, in practice, so in practice we choose this capital lambda as a part of capital X such that capital lambda intersection with any equivalence class will be just one singleton element. Usually that singleton element we call it as a representative of that equivalence class. So, this singleton called a representative of that equivalence class. Okay. So, in particularly this can be rewritten as X is disjoint union of this bracket X where X comes from this capital lambda. Okay. So, that is why in most of the books they use this notation. Okay. So, this means we have chosen a set of representatives from each equivalence class and then represented them using this indexing set capital lambda and X is nothing but disjoint union of this equivalence classes corresponding to the elements coming from capital lambda. So, that is very clear from this lemma because the union of equivalence classes definitely will be exactly equal to X, but using this lemma it can be easily seen that given two equivalence classes either they are equal or they are disjoint. In particularly they form a partition. So, what this proportion says this collection the equivalence classes where X is coming from lambda. So, they form a partition of capital X. And it is not very hard to actually see. So, any partition actually comes from 
such an such a equal such an equivalence relation so what one can do okay one can start with a partition something like this that is there in this definition and then you can define an equivalence relation on capital x using this partition let's say capital a lambda a alpha alpha coming from lambda so you just declare the elements that actually comes from this one single a lambda they are all related okay and then you simply say that uh, if elements comes from two distinct a alphas like a alpha and a beta they are not related okay so such relation one can actually see that uh, that will be equivalence relation on capital x and then when you take the equivalence classes corresponding to such equivalence relation that will be exactly this a alphas okay so i will leave it as exercise so here is the exercise so verify any partition comes from an equivalence relation okay so this is something we just uh, verified okay given equivalence relation how to get a partition and we are saying that any partition indeed comes from equivalence relation so with this general remark let's get back to our uh, cosets okay let us fix a group g so g is a group so note that we have in uh, assumed anything about the cardinality of the group group can be infinite as well okay and h is a subgroup of g so it is a subgroup of g so then we talked about left cosets of this h okay left cosets of h and what we indeed proved uh, in the last class uh, that this left cosets they form a partition of this capital g okay so these are called the set of left cosets of g so which we denoted by g modulo h okay and then it is actually uh, customary to do, denote the same g mod h for the indexing set of this set of all left cosets of g so what it means so we pick some representatives from each left coset of uh, uh, h in g and then we collect them together as uh, and then form a indexing set for this left cosets of g, h in g and then that also again will be denoted by g mod h okay up as sets one can identify the representatives and the cosets okay there is no issues okay so what is the proportion that we proved we proved that this set of all left cosets of uh, h in g they form a partition okay this g mod h x h okay now i can call x in again capital lambda so if you want you can actually see that this capital lambda is chosen subset of g that has bijective correspondence with uh, g mod h so this is the bijective correspondence so we, we saw in our examples okay the, there is always a natural choice for this capital lambda okay so that is what we are that is what we are talking about so so if you are not comfortable with this maybe i can actually just use the same notation so we often like i said we often write g mod h instead of capital lambda okay so we can say x h where x h comes from g mod h so this form a partition of capital g okay this is something we already proved so what is the proof 
So, it is very clear that uh, G is actually union of XH. Okay, Let us again uh, recall the proof because it is a very, very important fact. So, G is obviously union of XH, X in G. Why? Because we already noticed that uh, given any X in G, if we take XH, then X must be inside XH. Okay? So, that will imply G is subset of union of XH, X in G. So, that is easy to see. And because XH, they are all subset of G, because H is a subgroup, X is in G. So, XH must be a subset of G. So, this will be subset of G. So, that implies G is equal to union of XH, X in G. Okay? This is clear. And we already seen that if I give you two coset, for example, call it x h and then y h. If they intersect non trivially, then that immediately implies that the cosets they are must be same. Okay? So, it means given two cosets either they are equal or they are disjoint. So, that is actually tells us that it satisfies the definition of partition and so G can be written as uh, union of all these distinct cosets, okay, where the distinct cosets will come from G modulo H. So, this is the partition that we get. So, this is indeed very, very nice partition of G in, in terms of cosets. So, why, why is the case? Because if I take any coset, this X sketch, we already noticed that it looks alike H. So, that means in, in more set theoretic language, so XH and H both are bijective correspondence. Okay? There is a bijective correspondence between X H and, uh, and H. Okay? So, now uh, we can uh, state our uh, important theorem which is called Lagrange's theorem. So, what Lagrange's theorem actually tells us that uh, if you restrict yourself to finite group, okay, so then you can conclude from the remark that uh, G is a union of, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, this set of all uh, left cosets form a partition. From that, you can immediately conclude that the number of elements in H must divide the number of elements in G. So, that is called Lagrange's theorem. Okay? Let me state the theorem. So, Lagrange's theorem. So, what is Lagrange's theorem tells us? So, you assume G is a finite group. Okay? So, let G be a finite group. So, in particularly, I can talk about number of elements in G okay, or order of G. So, recall order of G is denoted by O of G, which actually counts the number of elements in G. Similarly, order of H is number of elements in capital H and for any X in G, order of X denotes the order of that element, order of x in g okay so now given a group g and a subgroup h of g so we can prove that the order of h must divide order of g okay so that is the first part of the lagrange theorem the second part of the lagrange theorem this ratio R of H divided by R of H, it exactly counts the number of left cosets, number of left cosets of H in G. Okay? And uh, if you think about it, so we have a natural bijection from the left cosets and the right cosets. So, in particularly, this also actually counts the number of right cosets of H in G. So, number of right cosets of H in G. Okay? So, this puts lots of restriction 
on the order of h okay once you know that given a group is finite group for example it has some very particular order, let's say 8 okay then the subgroups of that uh, group g which has order 8 that cannot have for example order 3 because the order of h must divide order of g okay so the possibility okay as an immediate corollary you can see if the group has order 8 then the order of h the possibilities must be 1 2 2 square or 2 cube so these are all the only possibilities that we have okay so this already gives lost of lots of restriction for the subgroups okay let us see how one can prove this so from our earlier proportion it is clear that g can be written as uh, disjoint union of the left co sets so in particularly so you have g equal to disjoint union of xh where x runs over this uh, coset representatives okay which we denoted by g mod h okay now note that so this equation immediately implies the order of g which is the number of elements inside the group so that is must be sum of order of x h where x runs over again g mod h okay because we have taken this group okay let us this call this is g and then we have divided this into h x h and so on so that means so if you want to count the elements inside this entire g then you have to count elements in h y h x h and so on so that is what this equation indeed telling you so now order of g is summation order of h sketch this but uh, we have already one bijective correspondence between x h and h so that is given by for example you can define a map from h to x h that the map goes to h to x h okay so this is a bijective correspondence between h and x h so that means the order of this uh, h is same as order of x h for all x in g okay so this is true for all x in g so if we use this in this equation star so then from star what we get we get exactly the order of g equal to so you just uh, sum it over okay call for example this g mod h as some x1 h etc some x k h so these are all the distinct left co sets so then it is clear that order of h is nothing but order of uh, sorry order of g is nothing but order of h summed over from i equal to 1 to k so then that is exactly equal to k times order of h so it is not only saying that the order of g is nothing but some multiple of order of h that multiple is come determined by the number of left cosets of this uh, h in g so indeed we are getting the number of left cosets is exactly equal to order of g divided by order of h so this is all possible because we are able to do this counting because we are assuming our group is finite so everything all the subsets are finite so we can count all of them even the number of uh, left cosets will be finite and so on so we are able to count everything okay so that actually proves the both statements in one go the order of h must divide r of g and as well as the ratio is nothing but uh, the number of left cosets of h in g and uh, in literature this ratio is often defined to be the index of h in g okay this is called index of h in g so there are many notation to actually uh, to denote this and uh, sometimes people use this mod g colon h to denote this index okay so we just uh, stick with uh, this r of g divided by r of h whenever if there is no confusion okay 
so it is a very very powerful theorem actually one can use this theorem to get many many interesting corollaries. For example, one can apply this theorem uh, directly to the groups that comes from number theory and then get, we can get many interesting results in number theory. So, let us see uh, many corollaries of this ok. So, I will first uh, start with one particular corollary ok which is immediate. So, suppose if your group has prime order ok. Let us start with the finite group G and then let us say the order of this group is uh, prime ok which we denote it by P. So, then what is the conclusion then G must be cyclic. And not only that G must be isomorphic to Z modulo P G ok because uh, we know that there exist only one group of order n up to isomorphism one cyclic group of order n up to isomorphism ok we once you conclude that the group is cyclic of order P then it must be isomorphic to Z modulo P G. So, how one can prove this? So, let us start with uh, some element which is non identity element inside G. And this is possible because we assumed P is prime. So, P must be at least 2 ok. So, so in particularly you should have an element that is different from identity and then look at this order of x. So, the order of x must be greater than 1 because it is not an identity element. Now, order of x must divide order of g. So, that is what Lagrange's theorem says. Why? because order of x is nothing but order of the subgroup generated by x ok that is something we have already seen. So, order of this uh, an element x is nothing but order of the subgroup it generates ok this is something we have already seen. So, in particularly order of x must divide order of g, but order of g is a prime number p and order of x is actually greater than 1. So, that would force that order of x must be equal to prime p because prime p has only 2 uh, divisors one and only one non-trivial divisor that is p itself. So, this tells that the subgroup generated by this x must be exactly equal to g. So, that means g is cyclic and g is isomorphic to p modulo g. So, if you notice we also proved on the way another corollary. So, for any x in g we also proved that order of x divides order of g because order of this x is nothing but order of the subgroup it generates ok. So, now let us see uh, how one can apply in uh, some number theory uh, examples ok. Uh, for example, one can prove easily Fermat's little theorem ok. This is the corollary 3. So, Fermat's little theorem it asserts about uh, some congruence ok. For any integer a in z and fix p prime number ok. So, let p be a prime number and for any integer a in z we have a power p is congruent to a modulo p ok. Whenever for any prime p and when you take any integer a you rise it power p a power p then that must be congruent to a modulo p it leaves remainder a when you divide by p. So, that is what uh, Fermat's little theorem says. So, how one can prove this? So, one has to consider recall. So, we have this group z modulo p z. So, this is an additive group. So, this also has this multiplication modulo p and then we can look at all the invertible elements with respect to the multiplication. So, this is something we already consider ok. So, this is the a multiplicative group uh, with respect to modulo p ok. So, what are this? So, if you recall, so 
the cardinality of this okay the order of this must be exactly phi of p okay so this is the euler phi function so phi of p we already proved that it must be exactly p minus 1 for prime p okay so the number of elements in this so these are nothing but those uh, these are parameterized by those positive integers okay between 1 and p which are relatively prime to p so you know that there are exactly p minus 1 el such elements so now <coughs> we will use this group to prove this okay for example if a is divided by p so then there is nothing to prove because a is congruent to 0 modulo p if a is congruent to 0 modulo p then a power p is also congruent to 0 modulo p so 0 congruent to 0 so there is no issue what if p does not divide a if p does not divide a then it is clear that I can look at this a plus p z so this element inside this group z modulo p z and then it must be lie inside this uh, multiplicity group okay because this will be invertible element inside this group so now if you take this x then what will be the order of x so one can easily see that order of x at least should divide the order of the group okay but order of the group is p minus 1 okay so that means this x power p minus 1 must be 1 or identity inside this group g okay so that is what we are getting so this x power p minus 1 must be identity inside in this group but what does it mean what does it mean this being identity so that means a power p minus 1 should be so when you take the product so that should be equal to the identity inside this group is 1 plus p z okay so a power p minus 1 should be congruent to 1 modulo p so that is what it says a power p minus 1 is congruent to 1 modulo p so now by multiplying a on both side because a is uh, invertible element so it, it is non zero element in this uh, group so by multiplying by a on both side we get a power p is congruent to a modulo p okay so that means it does not matter whether p divides a or p does not divide a we always get a power p is congruent to a modulo p okay so we will continue with other corollaries and other consequences of lagrange's theorem okay uh, i will stop now uh, we will continue in the next lecture. Thank you.